And now presenting DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Mr. Serge Leaf. Today I will talk about IDEA and POSH programs. So IDEA and POSH programs are open source accelerated chip design. And the challenge that uh, we are trying to support is the challenge that has existed in chip design for a long time. And that is that the product is half-sized every one and a half years, uh, following Moore's law. And uh, essentially, for every new iteration of the product, we may need new factories and potentially new tooling. And if, in fact, uh, cars followed the same uh, dynamics as chip design. By 2013, 1965, Volkswagen Beetle would be one millionth of an inch long and would be able to travel at one-eighth the speed of light. The response to all of this uh, was the emergence of electronic design automation. Constantly innovating to keep up with technology, three companies emerged. And these three uh, big EDA companies essentially represent 75% of all revenue. Um, and uh, there are many other small companies in this uh, business, but historically, the totality of all EDA companies other than the big three has generated only about uh, $2 million annually. So there, has always been, uh, there have always been three large EDA companies. They were different over the years. And uh, EDA market uh, also supported many small startups. And the small startups came into existence and uh, frequently were acquired by the big three. Occasionally, a challenger emerged that grew to significant revenue and was also acquired. There are many segments, um, and the big three normally allow the startups to explore new markets before considering acquisition. EDA startups are somewhat disadvantaged because they cannot attract venture financing and they typically only grow to about $10 million before in, in annual sales before needing a real sales channel. Um, and uh, so combination of this uh, forces the market dominated by several large companies and inability of startups to naturally grow essentially uh, have uh, resulted in high prices and stagnation of innovation. There have been few transformative technical advances since 1988 when the Synopsys design compiler first emerged. So the question uh, I have been trying to uh, answer is, can DARPA improve access and fuel advances through open source EDA technologies? And in order to do that, we need to think about focusing on economics and innovation. So several years ago, we started uh, a program called IDEA, Intelligent Design of Electronic Assets. Uh, no human in the loop. 24-hour layout generation for uh, mixed signal ICs, systems and package, and printed circuit boards. Machine-generated layout of electrical circuits and systems supported by machine learning and other artificial intelligence approaches. To complement this program, we also funded something called POSH, or Public Open Source Hardware. The, this uh, was uh, to provide a semiconductor IP to be used with the open source uh, design tools that we've created in IDEA. We've awarded uh, contracts to a number of parties in the area of simulation and verification, Sandia National Labs, Synopsys, Stanford, and Princeton Universities were and are the performers. Uh, synthesis and optimization activities uh, involve University of Southern California, University of Michigan, University of Washington, and Yale. And lastly, layout and implementation is uh, uh, an area that, uh, that uh, is being pursued by UC San Diego, University of Minnesota, University of Utah, and the University of Texas in Austin. So IDEA and POSH uh, resulted in sophisticated uh, analog and digital flows. In the analog flow, for instance, uh, USC uh, works on netlist optimization which is automatic performance optimization of parameterized analog circuit schematics. Synopsys has been developing um, an extension of their emulation uh, technology that incorporates real number models um, into their platform. Uh, Sandia Labs has uh, developed a free state-of-the-art analog simulator that makes cloud scaling and deployment on the cloud economically possible. 
University of Minnesota has focused on recognizing circuit structures uh, and repeating patterns uh, in um, in the designs to drive uh, high density analog synthesis. University of Texas in Austin um, has uh, a non-structured layout generator which uh, takes uh, uh, designs and creates high density custom analog layout. University of Michigan has pursued automatic assembly of mixed signal uh, systems for dramatic productivity improvement that's based on standards like IP exact. And lastly, uh, UC San Diego uh, has an exciting program called uh, uh, Open Road, uh, no human in the loop, 24 hour uh, automatic RTL to GDS2 physical implementation. On the digital side, uh, we have Stanford team that has uh, worked on automatic detection and localization of difficult bugs. Uh, University of Utah has worked on high performance synthesis and optimization where massive parallelism and sophisticated partitioning techniques are, are explored. Uh, Yale University has uh, focused on asynchronous design and has developed a comprehensive flow uh, to take asynchronous designs uh, all the way through the process. University of Utah and Princeton have attacked the problem of embedded FPGA fabrics and uh, incorporation of those FPGA fabrics either, either into full-blown array or into a larger SOC. And lastly, the open road program that I mentioned earlier is uh, uh, usable in both uh, analog and digital flow. What will follow my presentation are uh, presentations by the researchers uh, that are focusing on the two exciting areas that I just discussed. Uh, we will have Andrew Kang from UC San Diego um, uh, talk about uh, Open Road and the accomplishments of their team. And then Pierre Emmanuel uh, Guidron from University of Utah will discuss the embedded FPGA activities uh, conducted at that university. I am uh, delighted to welcome uh, Andrew and Pierre uh, to follow me uh, and to present their significant accomplishments. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Kong from UC San Diego. I'm here to present the Open Road Project on behalf of a really amazing team. The ERI recognized on day one that we face a crisis of design. Taking innovative ideas into silicon runs head on into barriers of cost, expertise, and risk. The cost of a wafer pretty much always ends up at a nickel or a dime per square millimeter. But this curve on the right says that the cost of designing that square millimeter is out of control. And this hardware design crisis has created a crisis of innovation. Our nation has got system innovation talent and software engineering talent in spades. There is a natural synergy here since hardware designers really write code in the Verilog and VHDL hardware description languages. The real crisis is that innovators can't tell how good their code is in terms of metrics that they care about, size, weight, and power, and performance. Fundamentally, this is because it's just too difficult for them to take their ideas, their Verilog and VHDL codes, into silicon. How do designers today transform a piece of Verilog or VHDL code into a manufacturable chip layout? Well, commercial EDA vendors offer extremely sophisticated tools that have thousands of commands. These tools enable bleeding edge customers to squeeze the ultimate performance, power, and area density out of a foundry's technology. But the tools are difficult to master. You need expert users who perform many manual steps, and there is schedule cost and risk. This is the crisis of design. The Open Road tool can deliver a layout that can be sent to the foundry in 24 hours with no human in the loop. 
Our focus is on ultimate ease of use, leveraging core innovative technologies such as partitioning, machine learning, and parallel optimization. Thus, our project directly attacks the crisis of design and the crisis of innovation. Schedule, we run in 24 hours. Expertise, it's a no human in the loop tool that outputs design rule clean layout. And cost, it's free open source. Why does this matter? Because this unleashes innovation. Teams can move forward with system ideation and design space exploration friction free with almost zero overheads. And especially for government and the defense industrial base, Open Road enables ownership of a more agile, transparent SOC design process behind firewalls and customizable to application needs. Our tool performs the RTL to GDS chip implementation flow, starting with logic synthesis and ending with a GDS2 tapeout database. A year ago, we showed a proof of capability, automatic generation of design rule clean layout in a Foundry 65 nanometer technology. The flow passed files from tool to tool, what you might call 1980s EDA. Today we have a V1.0 EDA tool, a modern integrated architecture, industry strength database and timing analysis, scripting interface for users, and we've achieved design rule clean layout generation in Global Foundry's 12LP process. Our project is easy to find, our repositories on GitHub, a nicely automated flow, and the integrated app, as we call it, which is the EDA tool. Some tutorial videos are online as well. Here's Open Road running on Swerve, a RISC-V based core from Western Digital. Starting from RTL Verilog, the tool performs logic synthesis, then macro placement with power ground mesh, standard cell placement, clock tree synthesis, and final routing. The whole flow takes about an hour. Our tape-in proof point is a version of the University of Washington's Black Parrot SOC. Here's a two-core variant with 700,000 cells and 98 macros in a three millimeter package. From the start of logic synthesis until the end of detailed routing and GDS merge is about 16 hours. Many people have been kicking the tires and even a bit more. eFabless built their open lane flow on top of Open Road and taped out this Strive SOC to Skywater Fab in May. What previously took a contractor six weeks was accomplished in around six hours. At the end of June, we received this nice shout out in a Google talk announcing the Google Skywater collaboration. The video was seen over 10,000 times in its first week on YouTube. Open Road worked out of the box for the Assure team at NYU, allowing them to measure overhead of their logic locking technique. We took obfuscated RTL and ran it on our end in GF12. This picture is the obfuscated AES core. Synthesis through end of routing took less than four minutes. We're starting to run some RTML program designs through Open Road as well. Open Road has made a number of breakthroughs and more lie ahead. We've delivered advanced node tapeout capability from an academic research project. Our tool is built to last with industrial strength foundations like the database and the timer. We've achieved many academic firsts, notably the detailed router and the aim for absolute automation to help conquer those barriers to innovation in hardware. And we feel that Open Road has legs for research, design and EDA innovation, and transitions beyond the ERI. We truly look forward to our phase two for growth and exciting transitions. Open Road can serve an ecosystem 
businesses, researchers, and the government's special design needs that may not be best served by today's flagship tools. We'll be growing our technology, especially to better leverage machine learning and cloud deployment. And we'll be growing our community. We'd really love to learn more about how Open Road can best serve folks in this audience. So on behalf of a great team, thank you for your attention and for your support. Hi, my name is Pierre-Manuel Gaillardin. I am an associate professor at the University of Utah, and it is my pleasure today to talk to you about the OpenFPG framework. FPGAs have unique advantages in modern computing systems. They are heavily used as coprocessor and accelerators in many signal processing and AI applications. They also provide an advantage of mission reconfigurability with the ability to reconfigure on the fly and across the life of a product its characteristics. Last but not least, it is also a secured media as a chip would not contain any critical information until it is actually programmed. However, the current offering has significant limitations. Indeed, only proprietary solutions are available, limiting the access to low-level details of the fabric. Second, they are associated with large licensing costs. Portability across technology nodes is also difficult. And last but not least, there are no domain-specific customization that is possible on those fabrics. In this context, OpenFPGA automates the process of designing domain-specific FPGAs and EFPGAs. OpenFPGA strives to solve the FPGA fabrics crisis of design. A traditional FPGA vendor has large teams of architects, other engineers, and software engineers, and using specifications from their customers and the application they want to support, they will come up with a more than a year effort with a production-ready layout and supporting CAD tools. On the other end, a single architect can use available open source tools to evaluate new architectures and come up with a very high-level uh, set of um, PP analysis. OpenFPGA aims at closing this gap and with a single man effort to be able to automatically create production-ready layouts and supporting tools. In that sense, OpenFPGA provides fast iteration and less manual efforts, reducing the time to market. It provides a very high level of portability between technology nodes and is highly scalable. It is fully open source, giving full transparency to users for secure application. And last but not least, it unlocks domain-specific features with the capability to customize your fabric for your specific class of application. To illustrate the efficiency of OpenFPGA, I'd like to talk about the FROG test chip. FROG stands for First Open Source FPGA, and it has been taped out a month ago on the Global Foundry 12 nanometer technology node. The FROG logic elements are state-of-the-art. They are supporting multiple operation modes, they have fracturable LUTs, and support DFT. This test chip was fully implemented using our automatic methodology in less than 18 hours, including sign-off. It is 100% hardware open source and portable to new technology nodes. And finally, it is supported by a community-developed open source tooling. To understand how OpenFPGA works, let me guide you through the design workflow. OpenFPGA abstracts the design complexity of FPGA fabrics using high-level descriptions. It takes an XML-based FPGA description that will provide details of the architecture as well as details on how to bind to an existing standard cell or custom cell library. From there, OpenFPGA will be able to generate your complete testing infrastructure for you to run in standard verification tools. It will generate netlists and timing constraints in order to run the fabric inside of backend tools and timing sign-off. With that, you can generate your complete fabrics in a fully automated way. So far, we have been able to achieve FPGA fabrics of more than 32 by 32 uh, blocks in size, and we have ported designs across multiple platforms and tested several PDKs 
Global Foundry 12 nanometers, 130 nanometers, TSMC 40, 180, and the Academic ASAP 7. So how customize can open FPGA be? Well, when a designer has the ID of the fabric that he wants to implement, it is possible to describe that using an FPGA architecture description language. This architecture description language support versatile cell libraries, multi-mode CLB architectures, tilable routing architectures, several configuration protocols, support for flexible function blocks, resulting in a fully customizable FPGA fabric. OpenFPGA also leads to high-performance fabrics. We indeed enable optimization on the critical blocks of FPGAs. FPGAs are composed by 90% of transmission gate-based multiplexers and configuration chain flip-flops. So with our methodology, it is possible to post-tech map a couple of custom standard cells that will be more suited for FPGAs than for ASICs. And with this capability, we show that we're capable of improving by more than 2x in area and 3x in delay what the current state of the heart can do. OpenFPGA also offers open source Verilog to Bitstream support for the end users. It's able to take a behavioral HDL as well as design constraints, synthesize it using its uh, sister project from the ID program called LS Oracle, run it through physical design within OpenFPGA, which results in Bitstream generation that can be implemented on your final FPGA fabric. This solves non-recurring engineering on the EDA tool chain for every single FPGA that OpenFPGA can generate. And it also benefits from continuous QOR improvement empowered by the community support. When designing an FPGA fabric or a new chip in general, verification is key. OpenFPGA fully supports functional gen verification using HDL simulators and auto-generates test benches. It also supports formal verification. We are continuously integrating 40 plus industry relevant benchmarks and architectures to guarantee that the source code and the quality of the OpenFPG fabrics match the state of the art. Last but not least, OpenFPG also provides complete support for full silicon sign off using industry standard tools. We believe OpenFPG empowers chip security. Indeed, OpenFPGA can be used to enable secure supply chain. Let's take an example where a system on chip contains a secret block. Instead of sending that to an untrusted foundry, you can replace this secret block by an OpenFPGA fabric that will be configured post-fabrication by the end user. In addition, OpenFPGA also enables new opportunities for secured silicon as support for security engines, as well as implementation of IP with logic obfuscation. To conclude my talk, I would like to go with a couple of remarks. The OpenFPGA framework provides a very large offering to support automated FPGA fabric generator with wide industry standard architecture support and end-to-end -end user EDA capabilities. It fuels innovation for the FPGA industry with reduced time to market, and de-risk new product prototyping. It also creates opportunity for national security applications through better mission reconfigurability and implementation of secured media against untrusted foundries. How to learn more about our project? Please feel free to browse our GitHub repository or reach out to discuss new features. You will always be in touch with one of our great team members illustrated on these slides Thank you so much for your attention. Back on stage, Mr. Serge Leaf. I'll talk about a new program called ACE, Automatic Implementation of Secure Silicon. So the goal of the program is to automate inclusion of scalable defense mechanisms into chip designs to enable security versus economics, trade-off exploration, and optimization. We know that in some cases, it's sufficient to put a lawn sign in front of your house to dissuade certain kinds of attackers from uh, becoming interested in your property. We also know from the movies that uh, even Fort Knox doesn't dissuade certain other type of attackers. So the idea that ACE 
uh, follows is that the cost and complexity of attack resistance mechanism needs to be proportionate or uh, consistent with the security threat you're trying to deal with. So large attack surface uh, uh, is what results from the high complexity of the chips that people design today. And um, the chips are complicated, and uh, thus humans inadvertently create opportunities for adversaries to uh, compromise them. The approach we take in ACE is uh, to create a platform-based design strategy where we have a platform generator which consists of multiple other generators that uh, make up different components of general and embedded computing subsystems on the chip. Significantly, what we add to this is a scalable security engine, which defends against the four attack surfaces uh, that ACE views as significant. So uh, the objectives of this program are incorporation of security into next generation system chips using platform-based design techniques and along the way, automation of the process of chip design, making, it, making the inclusion of uh, security an automated and seamless process. So in uh, ACE, we have three uh, components to the program. One uh, is on-chip security technologies that include uh, authentication, provisioning, monitoring, and policy enforcement. There are also security tools that one can use before a uh, chip is realized, and those uh, cover areas of obfuscation, watermarking, attack simulation, and threat analysis. And lastly, to put it all together, we need to have a silicon uh, platforms and uh, generators that produce the entire chip and interconnect and subsequently optimize the end result. So the goal of ACE is to make chip security pervasive through automation. So um, the idea here is that what we want to do is we want to synthesize the entire chip, but unlike the previous generation of design tools where uh, performance versus size trade-off was the only one considered, we want to incorporate performance, size, power, and security as the optimization uh, dimensions uh, for exploring the architectures. Furthermore, security is not a one thing. We are trying to defend against side channel attacks, supply chain attacks, reverse engineering, and malicious hardware. And so uh, what we'd like to do is optimize uh, architectures on seven dimensions. The key challenges uh, that we face in this program is quantification of security, uh, how do you measure it, multi, uh, multi-dimensional optimization, and our ability to estimate uh, resistance uh, to attacks. And we need to estimate that rapidly. So uh, over time, we're going to unroll capabilities here. One uh, plane of this is the design time. In the defense industrial base, it typically takes 24 to 36 months to design a chip. In commercial industrial base, maybe 9 to 12 months. Uh, in phase one of ACE, we are going to target three-month uh, design turnaround. Exiting phase two, it's going to be one month, and at the end of the program, one week. Um, similarly, on the security plane, uh, we uh, are going to uh, try to do a lot better than what industrial uh, bases and defense and commercial worlds do. And then in phase uh, one of ACE, we're going to roll out static security engine. Then uh, in phase two, security engine generator, and then in phase three, the security engine that's optimized uh, to the architecture. We also are going to roll out defenses against different attack surfaces over time. We're going to first roll out supply chain uh, uh, attack surface defense mechanisms, then we're going to add side channel and reverse engineering resistance, and ultimately add uh, malicious hardware or hardware trojans. Then uh, we are going to uh, essentially produce RTL in this program, and the RTL can be taken into implementation through another DARPA program called IDEA, uh, where we have uh, a system called Open Road, which can take RTL to GDS2 in 24 hours with no human in the loop. And uh, uh, we have recently awarded uh, this program to two teams. One team is led by Synopsys and includes ARM, University of Florida, UC San Diego, and a startup called UltraSuck. And uh, the other team is led by Northrop Grumman and includes IBM, University of Florida, and University of Arkansas. 
So in summary, uh, we are pushing for next generation EDA. In IDEA and POSH programs that were discussed earlier today, we're improving tool access through open source model. Through, uh, we reduce human involvement through automation, and we turn static IP into advanced generators. We're also looking to leverage machine learning for hardware optimization. OMG, another program discussed earlier today, um, uh, uh, focuses on driving state-of-the-art uh, uh, in obfuscation and logic locking. And lastly, ACE, the program I just described, um, we are going from block level uh, to system synthesis through multidimensional optimization from one-size-fits-all security to application-specific defenses. We are, in ACE, leveraging security technologies from OMG. We are uh, leveraging IP generator concepts from IDEA and POSH. And uh, we uh, see that immediate and incremental transition would happen because we have a commercial EDA vendor as a performer. Thank you very much. Now back on the virtual stage, Dr. Tom Rondeau. I'd like to talk about a program that deals with protecting data in almost any situation uh, that we might encounter it. Now, I want to start off thinking about uh, an old musical, Cabaret, if you're familiar with it. Uh, and one of the songs there that always gets stuck in my head whenever I, uh, I encounter it. And it's uh, by the MC, uh, Money Makes the World Go Round. Well, if we think about uh, another pop culture reference from the film Sneakers, Ben Kingsley's character Cosmo. The world isn't run by weapons anymore or energy or money. It's run by little ones and zeros, little bits of data. It's all just electrons. And thinking about it that way, well, I think the, that data makes the world go round. And if data is replacing uh, our value system of money, well, the data breaches are one of our biggest concerns that we should be dealing with. And we can see here on this chart, billions of data breaches or of, of data um, sources uh, get lost all the time. Uh, every week, there's new, new uh, press uh, about these types of data breaches, uh, information loss, information uh, access. Uh, all of our data is stored uh, uh, online these days, medical, banking, all the cellular data, all the machine learning that we talk all, uh, a lot about is based on uh, data processing and data analysis. Well, what do you do about that? Well, normally we protect our data through classic concepts of encryption, mathematical problems that we solve to move our data from unencrypted uh, space called plain text to encrypted space. So for instance, in this case, we're looking at a representation of the power grid. Well, it's valuable data. We encrypt it through a series of complex math equations that move it from plain text space into ciphertext space. And that ciphertext space here is now garbled information that from the outside you can't read. Then if you actually want to do anything with that data, now that data is really good for resting at, uh, at rest on, uh, in the cloud, on hard drives. It's good for moving it around the internet, around wireless networks. But if you want to do any processing or analysis, you have to decrypt the data, which is the inverse of those complex math equations. And only if you have the secret key will that uh, ciphertext go back to the original plain text. But now you're back in that problem where it's valuable but vulnerable data. So how do we protect data at all times, including while it's in use? And we're going to talk about uh, this program in terms of solving this problem of fully homomorphic encryption, which allows us to work on encrypted data uh, while never exposing it. So fully homomorphic encryption is a fairly new idea in mathematics. It's a little over 10 years old, and it's a very complex math problem to solve. Very much like encryption, there's a set of complex equations that move our, our plain text into ciphertext. But now, in that ciphertext space, any changes we make to the data, any manipulations we, we make, is the same effect on that data set as if we were to make those changes on the plain text. And that's where the term comes from, homomorphic. The same change we make over here happens in the plain text space over there. Great idea because now we can do all of our analytics while under, under protection of the, of the cipher. But what this graph is showing here is the problems that we run into. Today's software-based fully homomorphic encryption is orders of magnitude slower than processing on plain text data. So our baseline there of unencrypted processing, that's how we do things today. So in this case, we just did an analysis of uh, training a fairly simple convolutional neural network. Uh, it takes uh, about an hour in, uh, in today's terms on unencrypted processing. It takes about 15 years 
uh, is our estimate under software-based fully homomorphic encryption. So the program here is to try to build a hardware accelerator, really a processor, that understands the math problems of, of uh, what's called FHE to reduce the overhead. And we're, gonna, we're aiming for, in this gold bar here, we're aiming for about a 10x penalty over plain text processing. And I think that if we get to that 10x penalty, the cost now is outweighed by the value of the encrypted processing and what it can do for our, our data protections. So this is a hard problem, trying to solve chip architectures, flexible uh, data structures, uh, new programming models, all have to come together to build a, an entirely new concept of processing uh, that we've never tried before. So we're trying to uh, approach this in, in uh, this program called Deprive. And what that means is we're trying to protect our, our data in virtual environments. Because if you think about the future of 5G and beyond networks, virtual networking is a, is a core tenant. The amount of data that's going to be generated, moved, and processed in these 5G and beyond standards. Within the cloud, the virtual machines that the, clouds, uh, that the cloud is made up of, storing much more of our data and processing much more of that data. So we'd like to uh, have data uh, protection in these virtual environments. And so we call this program Deprive because we'd like to deprive our, the bad guys from being able to access, manipulate, process our data to protect both DOD assets as well as uh, personal and commercial sources of data. Thank you. Introducing DARPA Information Innovation Office Program Manager, Mr. Walter Weiss. When we look at computer security for modern architectures, uh, the movement has been to move to the cloud where we trust the ether to manage the separation between our data. Uh, this is concerning because there are a number of vulnerabilities that have come out recently, not just in hypervisors, but also in the CPUs that sit below them. Uh, Spectrum Meltdown have issues with keeping memory uh, separation. And one of the things that concerns us at DARPA is that we want architectures that we can depend on and are guaranteed to keep our data separate um, from the data we don't want to mix in. We don't believe that cybersecurity should start and end with software. And we're looking at DARPA to make new computer architectures that can be leveraged uh, to protect our data. And while others have attempted to build capability machines and segmentation before, they quickly became very difficult to program. Our goal in GAPS is to be able to solve both paradigms at the same time. We want to be able to build hardware that we can depend on while simultaneously building the language tools you need to effectively program them for cybersecurity purposes. We're going to walk through what this looks like. Today, when you want to store a single piece of sensitive data, we'll use an integer in this example of the top left. You compile your application, and then we treat the entire application at the highest level of sensitivity, and that's that red tainted area. This requires the highest level of protection, and in DoD, we call this classification. If your single variable in your application is tainted, your entire computer then also becomes uh, protected at this higher level. In the future with GAPS tools, what we'd like to be able to do is let developers instruct the compiler which areas are sensitive. What this lets us do is some tainted analysis to understand which sections of code actually handle the sensitive data. And then once the compiler understands, it can partition our application into different pieces and help us build novel computer architectures that let our data be where we want it to be when we want it to be there. In this more complicated example, with only six lines of code, we're able to annotate an algorithm responsible for synchronizing time-sensitive RF signals that are of different sensitivity levels. Based upon our directives, our GAPS compiler is able to automatically generate two different applications that handle separation requirements. Our compiler is able to create what we call shadow classes, data structures that are automatically created if they're needed by the receiving application to deal with data in this partition segment. The research to do this is being developed open source, and the latest tools are available on GitHub today that can do the separation for you. Within the GAPS architecture, the developer is then able to configure a GAPS hardware firewall with a human readable uh, schema to physically enforce the segmentation. This, when combined with the build chain, is able to generate 
the memory structures that are shipped between partitions, and you saw before how those become the shadow classes, the binary line rate protocols that are able to represent these objects on the wire. And then as we develop GAPS applications, we auto-generate bit files that get loaded directly into the FPGA that sit on the wire and enforce these rules. So during build time and during design time, you get stopped from doing uh, stupid things. And then during runtime, you're able to actually rely on your firewalls to physically enforce uh, these areas of separation and these rules. As GAPS moves forward, we've challenged ourselves to not just consider theoretical or classic network architecture programs. Instead, we focus on the harder swap-constrained embedded platforms with severe timing requirements. Moving forward, we're looking for to do a demonstration on a UAV involving a VPX slot-based mission computer. And at ERI, we're excited to offer an online workshop uh, tomorrow in which participants will be able to directly play with GAPS tools to compile GAPS applications and learn how to safely segment their software application. We look forward to working with any interested teams going forward on commercial demonstrations of GAPS tools on, on your applications. And as a reminder, all of this is open source and we'd be thrilled to collaborate with anyone who wants to participate in GAPS and accept relevant pull requests, especially those that include additional support for new hardware devices and architectures. Uh, thank you and I hope to see you tomorrow. Now on the virtual stage, our technical leadership panel, moderated by Mr. David Anderson, CEO of Semi Americas.